Uh, my name is Christoph Dressler. I direct the Go Learn program here at the University of Utah. We usually go and learn, um, which is a faculty-led travel program. Um, but uh, we are not going, but it doesn't mean we cannot learn something. And so on Thursdays or Fridays at noon, depending on when the professor has time, today Jonathan um, has time for us at noon at the traditional day of Thursday, uh, we have um, a professor giving us a little bit of their insight, an expert from the U, uh, Jonathan Duncan here with us today. Um, he's an adjunct professor at Westminster uh, College in adventure media. I didn't know that something like this exists, but that sounds really intriguing. I love adventure and I love photography myself. He's been a, a seasoned photojournalist for like the last 20 plus years. Um, he teaches at the Osho Lifelong Learning Institute here at the University of Utah too. Now that is a, a club of 50 years and better for a very small fee. I think it's $40 a year. You can join us. Um, he teaches the geography of Buddha. Uh, and for today, uh, we have a presentation on the spirit of high places. Um, um, I hope to learn a lot about mountains, about photography, about uh, people that uh, live in these remote areas and um, maybe some critters and informations that uh, I've never heard of. Um, again, I want to welcome everyone who has a degree from the University of Utah because this is also brought to you by the Alumni Association here from us at the University. So shout out to all the alumni far and near. If you feel like you come from a far away place, do let us know in the chat. I would love to know if you come from, I don't know, we had someone from Norway the other day. Um, I keep bragging about that little thing. So um, there is a question and answer on the bottom. If you run your cursor over your screen, you will see it popping up or the chat. Um, um, Jonathan will talk for about 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so, um, giving us a presentation on the spirit of high places. If you have questions, post them right there. At the end of this, we will get to our Q&A and we'll have a conversation about um, what we probably learned and also maybe uh, someone out there has visited these places and wants to share a little bit of, of their experiences, which would be great. Again, um, um, my introduction is um, rather spotty, so I'll hand it over to Jonathan to uh, uh, explain who he is and then share his screen and uh, welcome everyone out there to Go Learns uh, the Spirit of High Places. Thank you, Jonathan, for doing this for us. Hey, Christoph, thank you so much. And I appreciate you for all you're doing here, continuing um, this engagement with our community during these um, times. Uh, that was a pretty thorough um, introduction. As he mentioned, I am a, a professor at, down at Westminster College in adventure media and photography. And that is a new thing, Christoph. If you haven't heard of it, you're not alone. It's, um, it's an emerging field that uses the tools of digital technology as a means to share and to craft meaningful stories that we can you know, share through digital technology. Um, and so with that, I, I'm also very excited to be a member of Osher's staff, and I have been teaching for the last several years a class on Himalayan geography called um, the Geography of Buddha, which has been a really um, engaging and successful experiment for me. I just finished teaching a class on the sacred mountains of the world that this presentation is built upon. And so um, that it's all been informed for about 20 years of, of you know, adventuring. And, um, and so I'm going to share my screen. How's that? Okay, can everybody see that? Christoph, can you give me some feedback? Is that up now? Yes, you are. It looks awesome. <laughs> okay, so this is the spirit of high places, everybody. So let's, uh, let's take a journey, will you? If there is a case that maybe genetically we're meant to find who we are inside, what, you know, what role we're meant to play in life, I think I can trace back the camera from a very early age. This is a picture of me getting a brownie camera uh, on my fifth birthday, not my fifth birthday, it was Christmas when I, when I was five years old. And so I've always seen the world a little bit through the, through the photographic prism, through the lens. But this trip right here, this is a, a semester I spent in East Africa in, uh, with the National Outdoor Leadership School when I was 19 years old. I took a, what the British would call a gap year, but I took a year to travel abroad. Um, I never was the same after this trip. You know, we, we spent a month living on, uh, on Mount Kenya without the benefit of trails, just following animal paths and, you know, getting re-rationed. And it 
was just a mind boggling experience. You know, I'm the only member of my family that didn't become a lawyer. And I look back and I say, this was the trip that was determinative of like the direction I wanted to take my life. A few years later, I joined a expedition climbing up the north side of Mount McKinley or Denali. It was the Muldrow Karstens Ridge Glacier route. Um, that, that involved spending an entire month living on a glacier. You know, we would get up at three in the morning and ferry loads up into like the high camp. And, um, you know, this was my first introduction to big mountain mountaineering. And I came back and some, once again, a little something shifted. You know, I, I just realized that there was a lot out there and that the world is large, very mysterious. And, um, and I dedicated myself to that. So in the last 20 years since that first trip to Africa, you know, I've made any number of trips into the Himalayas. You know, I'll share some photos today from uh, the Ladakh region of India, from Sikkim, from Manaslu, from Annapurna, from Solukumbu. Uh, I've also explored in the Patagonian Andes, uh, uh, Antarctica, the Alaska Range, um, and many of the greater mountain ranges of the American West. And all of that experience is, has informed this, um, this presentation. You know, what, I'm, what I wanted to get at and what I want my work to represent, it's not my adventures and it's not necessarily what they've taught me. I want it to be more universal in terms of how human beings relate to mountains in high places, you know, what they mean. And so I'll be, I just have a... Oh, there Throughout the ages, people have looked to the mountains as the very embodiment of life's spiritual quest. Here the landscape of the mortal reaches closest to the heavens. We find in the heights a grand stage for life's divine play. Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, Jains, and eons of shamans and animists have all constructed stories of what mountains mean and how they are to be approached. Mountains are the embodiment of mighty gods, or portals to hidden realms, or cosmic altars, or ladders ascending into the heavens. Humans throughout history have looked to the heights and projected aspects of their own hidden self. Each person, every culture, constructs a distinct meaning of what a mountain is. As an historian of the sacred, Marcy Iliad writes, the symbol and religious significance of mountains is endless. At the heart of these stories is a sense that mountains possess a certain power. These are landscapes governed by different forces, places where it is possible to bridge a certain gap. The Japanese word yujin can be translated to mean either the world's great mysteries or its mountains. Okay, so Eric Shipton was a British explorer in the in kind of the heyday of Himalayan exploration in the, in the early part of the 20th century. And he did, you know, he punched into parts of the, re, of the Himalayas that were mapped. There was no maps. He, was, he could have been entering the moon. He would go into places that, you know, no European had ever set foot. And he would try to find a way to navigate the world's greatest mountain range. He writes in one of his books on the, on the region, he goes, in those ancient times when men worshiped the elements, a region that witnessed the birth of rivers and greater storms was naturally regarded with awe. And so when the worship of the elements was supplanted with the worship of gods, it began to be revered as their home. When I read that quote, it kind of seeded my thinking in terms of like, what is the symbolic significance of these high places, these places that are so unworldly, so beyond our control, so other dimensional. And so I've structured my talk. And incidentally, um, this talk is, has been structured into an ebook that will be available to anybody that's interested after the presentation. I'll, um, I'll mention more of that. But so I've broken down the, the initial section of my presentation into different ways to which human cultures have related to high places. You know, Edward Birnbaum wrote a very influential book called The Sacred Mountains of the World. And he writes, they are regarded traditionally as places of revelation, you know, the center of the universe, sources of life, pathways to heaven, temples of the gods. You know, the mythology of the mountains offers a metaphor for our spiritual journey through life. Here are stories of heroes and journeys, spirits and other dimensions. This is the making of the cosmic mountain, 
a landscape of imagination, of dreams, of legend. So these two photos you're looking at here on the left is, is Annapurna II and a Buddhist gompa, and this is in the Annapurna region. And you're looking on to the right is a mani wall or a prayer stone wall that's engraved out, outside of um, the village of uh, Manaslu. So my first talk, my first way that people have related to mountains in this presentation is, is the idea of embodiment. You know, so in the Puranas, which is one of the original texts in all of Hinduism that dates back over 2000 years ago, it writes, in the space of a hundred ages of the gods, I could not describe to you the glories of Himachal. That Himachal where Shiva dwells, where the Ganges falls like a tendril of a lotus from the foot of Vishnu. So what embodiment implies is that these mountains are actually a, a, a form of a, in a, a tangible expression of the sacred. You know, in Hinduism, they talk about the whole of the, Mount, of the Himalayas being an embodiment of Shiva, the mighty god of both creation and destruction. And what's important about that is when you look at a mountain range, these are unstable places. These are places of, of avalanche and rockfall and erosion where, you know, the greatest rivers of the world descend from the highest glacial you know, cirques. And so when you look at a mountain in, in, through the Hindu's prism, you're actually watching an embodiment of creation and destruction living in the mortal sphere. You know, mountains are representative of these, these, these divine forces. We can call it a god, we can call it the spirit, but what we see in high places is a tangible expression of that which is often nameless, the spirit. Now, pilgrimage is the way that most um, religions have tended to um, relate to these places. You know, in, in mountain regions have, have more, uh, you know, all throughout the Himalayas, and then we look into the all, you know, mountains for all around the world, they're sources of wisdom. These are places that people can engage into a journey of discovery. And by walking the path that the ancients have walked before us, we can gain an insight into what the, what the knowledge of the, all the generations that have come before. You know, Lama Dojin, I love this line I found. It goes, we must bring to realization the path of which the self encounters the self. And so in Buddhism, there's this idea and there's a poem or a, a Buddhist saying. It says, the search for enlightenment is a lot like riding an ox in search of an ox. And what that means is we're already there. You know, the pilgrimage, you're entering into a journey of self-discovery to determine what is already inside of us. You know, we are already enlightened beings waiting to be awakened to that realization. And the journey, the pilgrimage offers us a chance. It's like a, it's a ritual. And so you can see here, this is a, a pilgrim in Tibet, a, pil, a, a pilgrim in Tibet. And he's, um, he's, he's entering into this form of, it's like a meditative trance and pilgrimage where every inch of your body touches the entire pathway. And the pilgrimage in this regard is viewed as a source of merit. You know, if we're trying to gain karmic merit in order to you know, you know, progress down the path towards personal enlightenment, then and the journey offers an opportunity to gain that merit. You know, it's like it's through the, 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 the commitment and the, the process and the ceremony of the, of the journey, we emerge different. You know, we emerge having exposed ourselves to the wisdom of the ancients. You know, Lama Govinda writes, just as a white summer cloud in harmony with heaven and earth freely floats in the blue sky from horizon to horizon, following the breath of the atmosphere, in the same way the pilgrim abandons himself to the breath of the greater life that leads him beyond the farthest horizon to an aim which is already present within him, though hidden from his sight. Now, I made these two photos some years ago in the Lambrong Monastery, which is one of the five great monasteries of Yellow Hat Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and I learned a lot during this, this time. I spent about you know, five nights living in a cell in the monastery out on the Tibetan plateau. And from it, I learned what I think the big takeaway is this concept that Tibetans have of intention. You know, there is a word, it's called your chu. It's not to be mistaken with the Chinese qi, which is your life force, but your chu is your intentionality. It means that, you know, you walk through life, you know, broadcasting an intention. And the key to being a successful traveler through this idea is that if you engage in the journey with the best of intentions, people can tell and they're open to you, they're receptive. If you enter into the journey with ill intentions, then, you're, then it's, 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 it's doomed to be a dark journey. 
Now, Hidden Realms is one of the more mystical and, 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 and interesting visions of, of mountain spaces. And so in the Buddhists, they have this idea of behus. And a behu is a hidden, if you ever heard of Shangri-La, um, that, that is a myth, that's, that's, that's a take on this idea of hidden realms. And so I've been to a few of them in the Himalayas and what they are, they're usually large mountain valleys, you know, so there's a, there's a valley outside, the Solukumbu is considered to be a, a Behul. So there's the Zanskar range in Ladakh is a Behul. Um, there's, a, there's a valley outside of Manaslu that's beauty to be a Behul. And what these are is they're, they're like, they're, it's, a, it's a place that if you have developed the spiritual, you know, um, storehouse, if you accumulated the karma that enables you to be receptive to these forces, then and if you enter into one of these spaces with that level of preparedness, then you can enter a different dimension. You know, Baals in the Himalayas are legends of hidden realms. They offer spiritually initiated access to another reality, like Shambhala and Shangri-La are stories of these secret places, these portals into different dimensions. Now, I made this photograph in Ladakh of a, uh, an, an old monastery up in, um, the, in the Marka Valley. And there are any number of these Baals. And, you know, and I've come to this realization after you know teaching about sacred mounts for some years now that even if there aren't actual portals where you do physically enter into a different dimension, the belief or the the engagement with landscape to believe that if you have in your in your sensibility that there is something sacred at work, that's real. You know, if you have if you enter into sacred spaces with the intent of of having a transformative experience, and you do, that's real. You know, so that, that this doesn't, you don't have to look at Shamba, you know, Shangri-La or Shambhala as like a geographical a fact or an anomaly. What it can be is like Joseph Campbell would always talk about, mythologies are stories that bring us meaning, you know? And so if you engage in this pursuit of sacred lands and you have this feeling that you enter into it with the proper intent and you want to have an insight, the, if, and you do have an insight, that's real. You know, sacred space is real. And so that leads us to the idea of the genus loci. And this is, is cross-cultural. There's ideas, the genus loci goes in, like if you, if you go to the Oracle of Delphi, and you know, this goes back to the Greeks. And it also has a companion in like Native American you know, mythology. We, have, we see it all around the world. And what the idea of the genus loci is that certain places are embodied within the spirit. You know, like you could say, like, you know, let's say I, I always tend to, I took this photograph out in Antelope Island. And for whatever reason, almost every time I go out to Antelope Island, I encounter something amazing. You know, like there's always a, a display of light or, or even the crazy part. If you've ever been at Antelope Island when they have the spider hatch, you know, I took a delegation from Pakistan out to Antelope Island and it happened to be during that spider hatch where there were literally millions of these giant purple spiders and they looked at me like I was crazy but it was something you know it was an experience it was like wow this is a living so I, ha I have a belief that Antelope Island has a genus loci it's like a spirit of the place and the idea of the genus loci is that these are animating forces it could be a grove of trees it could be a mountain summit it could be a mountain pass it could be a lake it often is a lake and in that you know like th there's something there that generations of people have had sacred encounters with this spirit and so there is this belief that the earth is populated with the genus loci. Now, the idea of, of the earth being animated by spirits is one of the oldest stories in human culture. You know, the first religions were all animists, which, at, which, at, which at, attributes spiritual essences to all varieties of physical properties, rocks, trees, mountains, rainbows, and even the weather are, I like this word, are alive and endowed with a distinct spirit. Now, I made this photo down in Chesler Park in Canyonlands, which is another place that seems to have some resonance. Now, the axis of the spheres, so I, 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 compa I made um, the Patagonian Andes the illustration for this, because they are so dramatic in, their, in terms of the way that they aspire to the, you know, to the, to the heavens. But you know, the axis of the spheres is familiar to anybody who has read you know, Dante's um, you know, The Divine Comedy. You know, he, on Mount Purgatory, that is where the, the, the sacred meets the profane. And there is an ascent in our human lives are a ascent out of you know, the drudgery of, of profane existence and aspiring to that of the heavens. 
And the axis of the spheres finds metaphors a lot across, you know, all throughout different types of mythologies. But it, essentially, it's this idea that these spaces provide either a metaphorical or maybe a literal opportunity to to transcend different dimensions. You know, like we, well, I think about like even Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, where we begin with the very basics and then at the summit we reach self-actualization. And so mountains, just by their very nature, you know, if you look at like in different symbol symbols around the world whether it be the pyramids that the Egyptians constructed or the stupas that we find in Buddhist Asia or the ziggurats of, you know, the Mayans. Um, the, the, the aspiring symbol of the ziggurat, which is a, you know, it's a pyramid. And a lot of the symbologists believe that to be a mimic of the mountain. You know, the mountain becomes the symbol and the ascent out of you know, the mortal sphere and into something that is a different dimension, that's the, we call it the sacred, that's the axis of the spheres. Now, refuge, it might not be like a mythological tradition, but it is also something that is very true in anthropology and, and just, you know, the study of human culture. And that is because mountains are among the world's most remote and inhospitable and hard to access, you know, regions, they've provided refuge for oppressed people for time immemorial. You know, what mountains have done, like in the Himalayas as an example, what we find in the highest peaks in the world are these Tibetan Buddhist, you know, settlements. And, to, you know, Buddha, Tibetan Buddhists live, they, they, they will farm and they will have livestock up to 15,000 feet. And you just think about that, that's higher than any summit in the lower 48 states of the United States. And they live in these, in these altitudes. And a part of that, you know, one of it is one aspect of the, that reality is they're safe there. You know, like, you know, we, you know, the Buddhists at one point were the dominant culture of India until the Mongol invasion. And then we had the rise of the national, Hindu nationalism. And there were a series of pogroms that, you know, that tried to get rid of Buddhism in, in India. And it was to some degree successful. You know, Buddhist, it, you know, Buddhist it is not a thriving culture in the low country of India. And as you probably are familiar, what happened with the Chinese invasion of Tibet in the 1950s, that there is an ongoing struggle for Tibet, cult, Tibetan culture to find a safe like refuge. And the mountains of the Himalayas have provided that. It's like they, they view the mountains are like natural fortresses that enable people that are being oppressed by a dominant culture to find refuge. And so I, I put this frame of this, uh, this young girl like co collecting firewood in Annapurna, or the Solo Kumbu, excuse me. And I write with it, it's like, it takes a rare form of resilience for a culture to survive in the mountains. You know, mountain people tend to be industrious, hardworking, and good humored. The economy of the Himalayas, for example, is based on trade and tourism and agriculture, each of which requires an ability to cooperate and an openness to different people. The reputation of mountain people being kind and gracious to strangers is well earned, it is a part of the way that they have survived through the centuries. And so I put together a series of portraits that I've made from different parts of the Himalayas. And when I think about it, like, you know, if, if any of you have had the, the, the privilege of being able to travel in this part of the world, you know, there's a saying that we always go to the Himalayas to see the mountains, but we return because of the people. You know, uh, the people of the region, um, whether it be, you know, Tibet or Sikkim or Ladakh or, you know, all across the, the, the 3,000 kilometers of the region, um, you, you encounter people that are so joyful and so appreciative for the simplest pleasures. And, and you know, you, we study this. It's like, you know, why is Nepal, which has like a GDP of something like 600, you know, per capita, like very, very poor country. And, yeah, but people like, you know, they, there's a certain joyfulness to the culture. There's a certain appreciation for the simplest things. And, and that is, you know, living in a world like we do today, there's something invaluable about realizing that people can still have that good naturedness in a world that is so complex. Now, one of my favorite ways of viewing the, you know, the mountain um, paradigm is the hero's journey. And those of you who are, um, you know, fluent in Joseph Campbell's writings, you know, he, you know, he was a big believer in the idea of the hero and the hero's journey. And so the way I look at the hero's journey, first off, it's an archetypical myth. 
And it goes back, like you could make the case that the, the story that Jesus's life was representative of the hero's journey. Buddha's life was representative of the hero's journey. Muhammad was a, was a hero to his people. And what the, the, the essential arc of the narrative is that somebody has the bravery to leave what it is that they're comforted, the, the comfort of their known existence. And they go out into the unknown in search of the boon of wisdom. You know, they, they, they have this realization that the world is, is, there's a different reality outside of what is known to us. And you engage in the journey, the hero's journey. And the benefit of the journey is you can return to your people, to your culture, to your village, to your, you know, your tribe. And you have, can open their eyes to a different way of perceiving the world. And that's the hero's journey. And so I think of the hero's journey in the context of, of mountain adventuring. And it gives us a stage. You know, like, so what I, um, I put this quote with, you know, from Joseph Campbell, say, people say what we are all seeking is the meaning of life. I think what we are seeking is the experience of being alive so that our lives on a purely physical plane will have resonance with our innermost being and reality so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. And there's a lot packed into that statement. And if you can like wrap your arms around what that means in terms of from a personal philosophy standpoint, it's like, we're not looking for the meaning of life necessarily. What we're looking for is the experience of living, you know? And I think, you know, sometimes the journey into these, these, these landscapes, you know, it offers us a, a you know, a, a, a canvas to experiment, to, to see who we really are. You know, um, I, you know, had a, an opportunity, I'll show you a photo here coming up. Um, you know, I, I climbed a, a big mountain down in the Sierras a few weeks ago, and it was a lot harder than I anticipated. And, you know, we were up six pitches up this space. And, and, and I had this moment of like, I had, I had forgotten, like, you know, if you put yourself into situations where you test whether you can hold it together, you know, you, 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 you place yourself in circumstances where you really do have to be on top of things. And if you have the experience of like of, of passing that test, it's really invigorating, you know, and it gives you a sense of confidence in other aspects of your life. And that's part of what makes, you know, mountain climbing and mountain adventuring um, so exciting. So for this next section, I thought I would just bring you to a few of these spaces and introduce you to some of the world's great mountain ranges and uh, maybe tell a few stories. You know, when I was 24, uh, I got on a plane and, um, and I landed in Kathmandu. And I managed to walk to the Everest base camp alone. And um, that was another one of those pilgrimages, those life transformations. And Everest is known as Sagamatha to the Tibetans or the Cholokumba, which is the, you know, the, um, the mother goddess of the sky. It, Everest is not the most aesthetic mountain in the world. And for a lot of mountain climbers, it's not even the ultimate test. You know, it's, it's just, we in the West have this idea that bigger is always better, but the trip to Everest in the 1990s was a big step for me. It was, it was an experience and it was, it was about the people. It was about having confidence in my ability to, you know, navigate the world literally. Um, but the Solo Kumbu is, is it, 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 it's a magic space, you know, so this is, um, you know, the uh, carving of the Buddha at Soyambunath, which is one of the most famous um, stupas in Kathmandu. You can see um, a, a stupa over here. This is a, a recluary mound, which is um, essentially a, a, a place of reverence for the Buddha. And in, in historical terms, it used to be a place where some relic of, of Sakyamuni, the, the Buddha of, of history, the Buddha you've probably heard of, um, th these were places, shrines that were, you know, imbued with his, his spirit. And this is a photo I made of what is a very beautiful mountain. And this is Ama de Blom, which is, I think, one of the most um, aesthetic summits in, in all of the region. So another of the world's iconic mountain ranges are the Patagonian Andes. And this is a photo taken at, at um, the very break of sunrise of Torres del Paine in Torres del Paine National Park in Chile. And these are some of the more iconic mountains in the world. Um, and I've made a, a two different trips down there separated by about 15 years in time. And a lot has changed over that time. And, you know, my first trip into uh, the Patagonia, the Andes in the, in the mid 1990s, you know, I basically had the place to myself. You know, I ran into, uh, I, I helped fish out a, a, an Israeli trekker who'd fallen into a river and we made fast friends. And it was his little group was the only people I ran into. Um, on this last trip a few years ago, it, it was obviously had been discovered and Instagrammed, but um, the Patagonians are still a magical place. And this image on the right is one of my favorites that of in my um, 
archives and it's uh, Sierra Torre in Argentina. And this is Los Cosores uh, National Park. And Sierra Torre is a magnificent mountain. At one point it was considered to be one of the hardest mountains in the world to climb because of just the conditions, the weather, the severity of the, you know, the, the face is sheer. Um, and it has this mushroom like, um, uh, you know, kind of not, it's not a glacier, but there's a, there's this, there's snow mushroom on the summit that it tends to be a crux pitch because you have to, you know, somehow get purchased onto this like snowy mountain mushroom summit. But I, I dream of the Patagonian Andes. If anybody has, um, wears Patagonian clothing, you might recognize this. This is Mount Fitzroy, named after um, the boat that led uh, Darwin into, on his, his, um, his first trip into the region. And you, this is the Patagonia label you know, on Patagonia clothing, because Yvonne Chouinard had one of the defining adventures of his life when he and a group of uh, Yosemite climbers jumped in a Ford van and drove the complete length of from California, from Ventura to Fitzroy. And that's a heck of a long drive in a 1950s Ford van. And they made it successful. They put up uh, the California route, uh, which was a first descent route onto Mount Fitzroy. Became, and, when, and he came home and, uh, and the rest is history. He started Patagonia Clothing. Now, this is a place, so Christoph is mentioned uh, briefly, um, if we can get to a space where it's safe to travel and we're comfortable with, you know, what's going on in terms of the world and um, the spread of the pandemic has been contained, we intend to take a go learn trip to Ladakh. And Ladakh, in my, in recent memory, I was there uh, three years ago, and um, it is a magical place. You know, this is a view of the Suru River winding its way across the plains of Rangbuk in the Zanskar range. And I'm not kidding. That sounds like it's right out of J.R. Tolkien. It's like, this is like, this is like Middle Earth. This is like a very, very cool place. And so I spent a month uh, exploring and meeting and interviewing and photographing people um, throughout Ladakh. And it was, I, I already showed you this photo earlier. I, I made this photo from a homestay, which is an interesting way to trek. And because there's only about part of the, part of what makes Ladakh so interesting is it's on the Tibetan plateau. And so it's on the backside of the Himalayas. You know, if you're looking at it from approaching it from India and so for like three months of the year, it is completely cut off from automotive travel. Like, you know, people that live, like the people that live in this village of Sarah, you know, they have to be completely self-sufficient. You know, there's no, I mean, first off, there's no roads here. You know, this is a trekking uh, destination. But um, there's this element that to, the, to, you know, to be in like 2020, have this realization that there are still populations of people that live without the benefit of internal combustion engines or, um, you know, like, you know, wired electricity or cell coverage and all that. Um, it, it, that makes me feel as if I'm living in a, a bigger, more interesting world, but just knowing that. This is the, lim the librarian monk, or somebody, not, I don't think he would call himself a librarian, but he's in the library and he's the guy that has the keys to the library at the Tilske Monastery in, outside Le in Ladakh. And I was going through you know, some of their old scrolls and, um, and I just caught this light coming in from the, you know, from the window and um, it, really, it really struck me as um, a special moment to, um, to be there. Another region um, that I've found to be fairly fascinating is Manaslu, which is the world's sixth highest peak. I believe I could be, that could be, I think it's sixth highest peak, but it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's like a summit. It's over 26,000 feet. And it's like the summit a child would draw. It's like a perfect ziggurat. It's like, a, it's a pyramid, a pyramidal image. And so a few years ago, maybe six years ago, I circumnavigated Manaslu. It's like a 200 mile trek. Um, this is a photo I made at 15,000 feet. And I was staying in a, a, a lodge that had uh, a rooftop kind of balcony uh, where the, and I got up there on this moonlit, perfectly clear night and I made a 25 minute exposure. And so what that, and what that means, I set up a tripod and there's, you know, if anybody's familiar with astrophotography, uh, I shot it at 400 ISO F4 as an aperture and I let the shutter open for 25 minutes. And this is the resulting image. And I met this Tibetan trader during a Buddhist, um, it was a funeral ceremony that was taking place. And I was invited into this like smoky kitchen tent. And it reminded me of the photos I looked at the National Geographic when I was a kid, you know, where they, you just have these like just magic light beams coming down. And it was, a, it was really quite an experience. And um, this, this person, um, you know, he still is a part of my imagination. It's interesting how people, when you travel, 
Um, it's possible to make, I think, significant human connections even without language. You know, I, I still think of this guy and, you know, and he became a part of me and we weren't able to share a single word. We just, we just drank, you know, uh, uh, salt butter tea and, and, and laughed at like our inability to understand each other. And I still think about it. I mentioned earlier that I did a Denali trip when I was in my 20s, and this was a definitive moment. So you're looking up the, the great ice fall of the Muldrow Glacier, which is the most dangerous aspect of this climb. But it was, it was something. It was like, you know, spending a month um, living without, like, there's nothing living up there except for, like, there, if there might be lichen growing on the rocks, then there's the occasional raven that's hoping to, you know, to swoop in and steal some of your, your oatmeal or whatever. Um, the hardest part of this trip, though, is Knowles wouldn't let me drink coffee. And so I, I, I remember that month without coffee was something that, you know, I've never done that before. I travel everywhere I go, I bring coffee. And, but Knowles didn't want us to be getting dehydrated. So um, I lived for a month without coffee. And that proved to be more heroic than the climbing. This is what might be one of the most beautiful campsites in the entire world. You know, this is on the Karstens Ridge. And you have Mount Tatum and Carpe in the background. And um, you can see how we dug in, like we, we dug in four or five feet because it's possible to get these like 100 mile an hour gales that come out of nowhere coming down these glaciers. They're, they're very, there's differential cooling that takes place in these big icy mountains. And so you never know, and you always have to be prepared for at a moment's notice, there might be a 100 mile an hour wind. And if you're camped without it being entrenched, that wind would blow you right off the mountain. And so, you know, there's a lot of effort in climbing uh, glacial peaks. That is the summit of North America. And that is a lenticular cloud, which means that there are 100 mile an hour winds up there. <laughs> so, yeah, that's if you ever want to know what the summit of North America looks like, that's it. And the La Mer Channel, you know, I was a member of a, a the National Geographic trip that went into Antarctica. And, you know, that's the only time I've ever been that far into, you know, the ice country of the, of the far south. And, it, it is a it is a quiet, magical, serene place. You know, it's a it's a, it's one place that human beings just have never settled. You know, it's it's just so inhospitable and so surreal. And and when I say surreal, I mean it. It's like something of like you know, it's a dream state. And when you're like you know you're traveling through these these ice channels and you encounter like I remember we we took these zodiac they're like you know um, motorized rafts and that's how you go land on the ice falls. And I remember we were approaching one. I was like, what is that? Is that, is that like a black sand beach? And it wasn't black sand beach. It was a penguin rookery with like a million penguins. And you're like, whoa, and you're like, there's still places on earth where a million penguins live on a beach in Antarctica. And then you get these giant icebergs. And, and I was inquiring to one of the geologists I was with about, you know, why are some of them so blue like that? What, what's, what's causing that hue? And I guess what he was saying is some of these are ancient. Some of these go back 10,000 to 20,000 years. And as they get top heavy, they roll over on each other. And these very dark blue um, icebergs are indicative of a lot of compression that's taken place. And so they're actually, these are the old dads. These are, you know, these are the grandpa of the, um, of the iceberg world. You know, some of my favorite mountains in all of um, North America, some of my favorite mountains in the world are the High Sierra. And so if you're familiar with this, um, this is the, the view from the Alabama Hills, not in Alabama. It's outside Lone Pine, um, which is just south of Bishop. Um, so you, it's on the east side of the Sierra. And that mountain scarp along that part of the country is known for its just magic displays of light. And when I teach my photo students about like the hunting for the best photographic light. It's commonly known amongst adventure photographers that the Sierra has some of the best light in the world. And the reason for that is uh, explainable. And that is the sun rises in Death Valley, which is, you know, 300 feet below sea level and it strikes a fit like 14,000 foot mountain. And so that is the, the most filtered light anywhere on the planet. You know, it's, it's, um, it's remarkably well, like just soft and you get these like incredible, you know, cues and these displays and these clouds. And, you know, I've never been to the Sierra where I have not been just, you know, flabbergasted with the displays of light and the mountains are big. You know, I, this is Mount Emerson, which I climbed a couple weeks ago and um, you know, we, you know, my friend and I were, you know, we thought we had this thing and we did, you know, we, we, it all went well, but it just, it was a reminder that, you know, the Sierras are real mountains, you know, they take a lot of effort to get to the summit of these places. And when, when you get there, there's just these waves of 
rock formations that go you know out into the horizon. You know, the Sierras are special. And I thought we, you know, we, I would be remiss to not bring us in. We can all be nostalgic for our own uh, home country. You know, the Colorado Plateau, I've, I've been a few places around the world. I've spent a lot of time uh, exploring what are some of the most considered to be some of the more spectacular geography on the planet. And there's nothing like the Colorado Plateau. You know, like what we have in this state um, is, you know, it's representative of nature at its best. It's, it's very magnificent. And um, I'm even planning a trip, you know, in the next week or two. This is the season, as you know, um, to go out. There's the crisp air and um, hopefully, you know, usually there's less people. I don't know this year. I understand there's, there's still a lot of problems with the crowds to, you know, right now. But the Colorado Plateau is magic. You know, so I took this photo um, from the Maze District in Canyonlands during one of those super moons we had a couple of years ago. So this isn't Photoshop trickery. This is actually just a 300 millimeter lens. Um, and, you know, there's, there's something just so austere, you know, like, um, you know, the, the desert is a sacred place, you know, and there's a reason for that. It, it, there, there's a, 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 an ability to convene with ourselves in the quiet of the canyon country that, um, you know, that you don't get in a lot of places around the world. You know, the canyon country is magic. You know, this is Wild Horse Canyon, where as legend has it, uh, Butch Cassidy would ditch his, um, the posses that were on his tail. He would cru cruise up Little Wild Horse Canyon. Um, this is outside in the San Rafael Swell. And then star streaks over the uh, over um, in Zion National Park. And what you, I described to you earlier about the photographic technique that uh, makes this possible. Now I'm going to you know end the geog geographic tour by just saying you know giving a talk to people at the University of Utah. Um, this is a it it it's, it has a happy ending for us because if you get inspired and you really wanted to experience yourself and hike in the mountains and see what they have to teach us. Um, we live in a, you know, the perfect entry pot to, you know, the mountain world. You know, you're probably familiar with uh, Mount Timpanogos down in Utah County, which has some of the most spectacular wildflower displays I've ever seen in the world. Um, you know, the, the Wasatch is where I grew up. It's my homeland. It's, uh, it's a part of me. You know, like Barry Lopez says, the landscapes you're exposed to in your youth become the gauze through which you experience the rest of your life. And that's been my feeling is that, you know, I, I think that there's something, I know there's something ingrained into my neural net in my mind um, that harkens back to, you know, my very first rock climb was the H rock, you know, above Foothill Drive, you know, that, uh, that rock that's graffitied with the Highland High School logo. Um, I grew up by that. And I remember like scrambling to the summit of the backside of the H rock. And that was, that was me getting my, you know, my you know, feet wet when I was five years old. And, you know, the, the autumnal colors, I, I don't know if it's, I, I actually got in touch with one of the foresters at uh, Utah State, because I was a little bit dismayed. I went up looking for um, photographs of autumn leaves this year, but our drought combined with the snap freeze and um, that, that windstorm, you know, we're, we're, we're not having a, a, the traditional display of color that we're all accustomed to. It, it just makes... For me, it just made 2020 even all, I just said hashtag 2020, no, no autumn leaves, you know, of course not. But it'll come back and, and this, I'm a snowbird skier and you know, that'll come back too. This is, I told you, if, if there's a Behu in Salt Lake, or it's actually, I think it's David Weber County, I don't know what county um, Antelope Island is in, but if there is a, a, a hidden you know, realm here, it might be Antelope Island, you know, I, every time I go out there. So this is a view of the Wasatch Range from the Great Salt Lake. And one final display of color. All right, I'm going to end my talk today with uh, a description of mountain climbing in, in the spirit of high places. You know, um, Robert McFarland, and if you're looking for a book that hits upon a lot of the themes in this talk, um, I've really found Robert McFarland's Mountains of the Mind to be a very inspiring read. It's a deep dive into the way that mountains influence us in our, in our thinking, in our culture, in our spiritual aspirations. And he writes, climbing upward came to represent, as it still does, the search for an entirely new way of being. Experience was unpredictable, more immediate, and more authentic in the mountains. In the mountains, you were a different you. And that's been my experience. You know, like, you know, back when I was uh, a single guy, I, I would, I was just always, I would just beg the pretty girls. I would say, seriously, just come into the mountains with me. You're going to like that guy. You know, I'm a different guy. You know, I'm, I'm, a I'm a nice guy in real life too. But, you know, in the mountains, we're different people. 
you know, and, and a lot of what we pretend to be has to like fade away. You know, if you're someone that is like, you know, if you have like integrity and you have a capacity to, um, you know, to, to collaborate, if you are, you know, like all of these elements that we'd like to think of as being character attributes, they display themselves in high, in high places. This was a climb up the Liberty Ridge on, on Mount Rainier, which is um, a, a magnificent um, climb. And this is from the Boogaboos in British Columbia. And that's the Owen Spaulding rappel off of um, the Grand Teton. You know, Hazel Finley, who is this young firecracker of a woman, a woman climber in her 20s, uh, she's really taking the world by storm, a Brit. And she, write, she wrote in Rock and Ice the other day, or you know, I guess it was last year. Goes, if your climbing makes your, your ego bigger, not smaller, then you're doing it wrong. And I'm like, yeah, that's the deal, man. It's like, you know, you know, climbing mountains requires a humility. It requires like an understanding that um, you're there on the terms of mother nature, of the mountain, you know, you know, the, the whole lexicon or idea of conquering the mountain, um, it's just wrong. I mean, you know, it's macho and machismo and wrong. You know, you don't conquer anything except for yourself. You know, this is the thing. It's like, it's mastery of the self. The mountain can flick you off like nothing. You, you do not get away with that. You know, it's like mountains teach us a, a level of, of humility. Yeah, this is uh, climbing uh, the early morning cool yar on the North Sister and the Cascades. And that's um, Boogaboo Spire in the Boogaboo Range. And uh, rock climbing in the uh, City of Rocks and on the Tetons. That's the Exum Direct uh, on the Grand Teton and the Carbon, uh, I think it's the Carbon Glacier on Mount Rainier. So I end my presentation today with this observation. You know, our mountain adventures offer a stage, a loom onto which we can weave the story of what lives inside us. There's so much more possibility in us than we imagine. And that's the takeaway. You know, I, I wanted the word just possibility, you know, to be our thought. You know, it's like, you know, if there are places and journeys and activities and adventures that allow us to explore what we're capable of, um, that is, you know, part of the spiritual role and path that we walk in this life. Thank you so much for your, your attention. I really appreciate you coming out today. Um, I wanted to make an offer that I, I let Christoph in, um, know. If anybody is, is interested in receiving a free copy of the ebook that I put together, The Spirit of High Places, just shoot me an email right there and I will send it to you uh, as a PDF. And it incorporates the photos that I just presented as well as the writing that goes along with them. And if you're interested in some of those quotes and where they came from, um, I'd be happy to share this. You know, part of the way that I dealt with my experience of um, you know, this pandemic and all of the you know, lunacy that we've lived through is I really you know, wanted to like dig into my work. And so I put together the Spirit of High Places uh, as a way to you know, um, find something that was a, a useful and inspiring use of my time during this period of history. So I'd be happy to share it with you. I guess that's my point. And if you wanna see the other work I do, uh, visit my website, alpinevisionmedia.net. And with that, um, I, we still have like about 10 minutes, or I can stay as long as you want. And so I'll stop the share and, um, and I'll allow Christoph to, you know, if, if we can maybe mediate some engagement. How's that? You're on. I knew it would be great to have you talk and take us on a virtual travel and uh, escape our living room for just a few minutes at least. Um, but, but I have to say, wow. And in <laughs> fact, that was, that was uh, I think, number one comment that somebody already posted. I have a few things I want to talk about <clears throat> and selfishly jump ahead, but it gives um, participants in the room to maybe ask a few more questions. And I'll, we have about two or three of them at this point, but uh, hopefully we'll get a few more coming. Um, uh, first of all, Knowles, you mentioned Knowles. I didn't know this. That's, you know, a lot of people, I think, uh, participated in the national outdoor leadership uh, programs and have, it has changed their lives just like uh, maybe a Peace Corps for some other people or other engagements. So a shout out to ever, anyone who has ever done Knowles. Yeah, Knowles is amazing. It's like, you know, that's the real thing. You know, um, you, you have to really, uh, you know, it's, it's an experience. 
truly life transforming. So and, does, uh, does someone out there have a question? I, I, yes. we, let's get to a few. Um, Susan says your photos and descriptions are fabulous for someone who wants to see Mount Everest, but doesn't want to climb it. Where do you recommend going? Thanks. Oh, okay, so the way, you know, Mount Everest, the base camp is a fairly approachable trek, and it usually takes about, um, depending on your acclimatization, it can be done in two weeks. And what that entails is flying into Kathmandu, and then you'll spend a day or two in Kathmandu, which is a fun city. Um, and then from there, you fly to Lukla. And that can be scary for some people if you don't like small planes. Um, but you fly, you have the experience on a small plane of feeling like you're flying into a mountain because the, the airstrip actually like it ends in the mountain. But, you know, you, they, they've done this before. And so then from Lukla, it's about, as I said, it's a two week trek. Um, you can do that uh, with like, you know, with a porter and a guide. Um, and that means that you're just hiking with, you know, a water bottle and a windbreaker and a camera. Um, and I've known people throughout in different stages of their lives and different fitness levels. And you can, you can reach the Everest Space Camp. And, and that, that is a, an adventure through the Solo Kumbu. Good question. Um, another, uh, yeah. And oh, so the trip to Ladakh. Let's talk about that. What's, what's the most difficult climb I've ever done? Um, well, in terms of just sheer energy and commitment, it was the Denali trip. Because that, that was like a, a that was a, a lot of um, effort. Um, and then I, I did a summer where, you know, I climbed the um, East Buttress on Mount Whitney and I've done the Liberty Ridge on Rainier and Exum on, on, on the Teton. And each one of those is different, you know, like is it ice climbing, is it glacier climbing, is it rock climbing? And right now I'm just totally addicted to the momentum climbing gym. And so I, I've, I've become kind of a gym rat, but so I get my, I get my jam um, in, the, uh, in the gym. But okay, so let's talk about Ladakh. And so if this were to happen, um, we're, like Christoph and I are working under the assumption that we'll find a way to make travel safe and effective by next summer. And that is still an if. But if all were to come, come well, and if we don't do it this summer, we'll do it another time because Ladakh is really approachable. What that involves is we'll fly into Delhi and we'll spend two days exploring old Delhi and just getting our, you know, our, getting our wings about us in terms of being the, in, in, in India, which is an experience. You know, India is an experience. And, and so we, but from, from Delhi, we fly into Leh and it's only like an hour flight and you go over the Himalayas and you land on the Tibet Plateau and it's a, it's a modern airport. I mean, it's not, it's not like Salt Lake International, but it, you know, it's an airport and you land in Leh and then we, I, I have a friend who is a, um, a, a guide and runs an outfitting company and he's really, really good at it. And so he would set us all up with, you know, like uh, accommodations and all of our meals and all of our transport. And the, the focus of the trip is largely like Buddhist art and culture. You know, we take a series of forays into these ancient monasteries. I would give lessons on Buddhist iconography. We talk about like the symbolism. We would, we attend this, this, this Buddhist harvest festival where, you know, these masked Tibetan dancers come out. It's really cool. I went there a few years ago. And then we'll, we'll take the highest motorable road in the world up to 15,000 feet. And then you descend into the Numbra Valley, which is extremely remote. And, um, and we'll explore like sand dunes at 15,000 feet. There's sand dunes in the Karakoram Himalaya. Um, and all of this is on Christoph's website. So if you're curious, you can take a slideshow through Ladakh and get more written details. But I'm really excited because I think um, of all the places I've been, um, Ladakh is really approachable. You know, there's not a lot of logistical hurdles. And, um, and I think, you know, it, you know there's, there's good plumbing and internet. And so I think, I think, you'd, I think you'd like it. All right, any, uh, we have just, you know, a few comments, of course, amazing and awesome from Belva. Uh, Wong Cherry says, I, want, I went to Ladakh in 1990, 1979. Oh my gosh, man, 1979, that would have been a thing. Wow. To see the wall art uh, in the compass. Don't miss it if you're going back. So okay. thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, the wall art, you saw some photos. Like, so I think the Tiltske Monastery was the most impressive in terms of their um, Buddhist iconography. That's a place that I'll go when, if we take this trip. Yeah, the, the wall art in the Gompas, it's, it's world class. You know, the, um, you know, art historians study uh, the Buddhist art of Ladakh as a thing. So Belva also writes about, um, she charged up Mount Olympus. Say that again? I'm just reading her comment about Mount Olympus. Oh, okay. so it depends on which Belva, it depends on which what route you went. If you came from uh, Pete's Rock, which is off of Wasatch Boulevard, um, you know, Mount Olympus is a, it's something to be proud of. It's 4,000 feet. 
you know, avert. And so that it's like, um, it's, it's not for everybody. I know that. Um, I, some years ago, climbed the West Slabs, which is just barely where the level we start to rope up. And, and that's exciting. You know, it, that takes a, it's a basically a full day um, of really kind of mo like low grade, you know, like it's just fifth class scrambling is what they call it. Um, but I had a lot of fun climbing um, Mount Olympus's West Slabs. That's a cool thing. So good for you, Velvet. Is that, the, is that called the Face of Medusa? It's actually, I don't know. It's West Slabs is the root. Is that what they're, they're called? The Medusa, mm, that's ominous. The Face of Medusa, Mount Olympus in Salt Lake City. Okay, so let's have, if anybody can just, we have another few minutes, and so I'd be, I'd be eager to hear anybody else. You saw else. Mark's comments there, right? That you have a book in you if you haven't written in yet. <laughs> I, I have a book great in you. description, great photos. Jonathan, if you're, uh, if you got at least one great book in you waiting um, to be written, um, so if you haven't already written it, so thank you, well, Mark. Well, you know, I appreciate it. So what I want then is, um, I want, is it Mark that was saying that? So Mark, send me an email and I'll send you the book I put together and maybe you can help me get make it better. How's that? <laughs> Spectacular presentation. Your photos are breathtaking and uh, we love our, uh, your philosophy. I, I agree. That was a few things that I wanted to talk about, but uh, you know, the hidden realm and all this, the hero's journey. Um, um, hopefully we're all are on a hero's journey, you know, we're doing the circle of uh, currently we're, we're, we're stepping in the unknown, you know, and we're over the threshold and, uh, but there will be a rebirth and there will be transformation and there will be, um, you know, the gift of goddess. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, if we're all on a, on a hero's journey, um, I think that's one of the great takeaways for me from today to think of our lives that way and to know we're going to come out of this and we're going to, we're going to travel again. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come out of this as different people for sure. When it so comes I, I wanted to, get, yes, I totally agree. Um, I was also interested in, I think Kathy had a comment. I don't know what Chadar is. You know, they, 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 in India, they're blaming this movie called the three idiots. I think it's called. Then it was like a Bollywood film that was filmed in Ladakh and it caused a tourist boom. She's right. I don't know what Chadar is, but there has been this thing since they did a, they filmed a, a movie in Ladakh. And so it increased um, domestic tourism. And there's been a huge like um, building boom in terms of lodges and infrastructure at, that is kind of bumming a lot of people out. The, my, one of our panelists that went to Ladakh in 1979 probably wouldn't, re, wouldn't recognize Lay today because, but I, I got over it. You know, what I figured out is I, I was initially a little bit put off by all the construction and the traffic. And then I began to see, you know, the diamond in the rough. You know, I began to notice the small things. And um, the problem with the world today is there's just too many human beings in it. I don't know if you knew that, but um, and so the Himalayas is suffering for that same problem. Um, what are some takeaway words you can give us from the lecture? Words I can remember to help me remember today's stories. So Julie, um, shoot me an email and I'll send you the PDF and then you can have it and you can go through the quotes and see where they came from. Um, that would probably be the most um, enduring way to, um, to keep that in, in your mind. And this is, uh, we were putting this on our YouTube channels and also on Go Learn's website. So you can revisit this uh, presentation we have a lot of people who can't make it today. So they, they're usually, a lot of people flock to these recordings. So we- Oh yeah, so what I'm gonna do just uh, to respond to Mark's um, comment is I'm gonna put up my email one more time because that's just the better way, uh, you, know, um, you know, Christoph indicated that we could just share, I could send that to everybody, but I don't need to send out a hundred copies of the book if you're not into it. And so if you are, um, Okay, so there's my email. I think we only have a minute or two left. And so if anybody has any final thoughts, um, I, I would just also say, hey, I really appreciate you all coming out. I really enjoyed myself. And, um, and here's the thing about like, you know, I, I'm, currently, I'm currently teaching at OSHA right now uh, a class on the history of photography, which is going really well, it's super interesting. And one of the things that, uh, that, I, that I talked about or we were, my research brought up is like, you know, art is a dynamic engagement with, with the viewer or the audience. And, and it doesn't have a complete, like completeness to it until, you know, you, you have that engagement where you're sharing. And so this, I, this opportunity this today to be able to come and share with you my work, um, it, it brings me a sense of, of accomplishment and fulfillment. So thank you for your time. And I really appreciate all of you. Feel free to get in touch, okay?
and thank you for your time. This was once again, um, just fantastic. I'm, I'm blown away. I can't wait to climb some mountain. <laughs> okay, all right, dude. All right, Christoph, go, get, go, get on, go get on the uh, Stairmaster and, uh, and, and, and then- Well, I live uh, right underneath of uh, Mount Olympus, so I'm gonna get on that Stairmaster. Okay, get on that Stairmaster. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a climb from, you know, especially coming back down, it, it hurts. No, no, I know, I've done it. It's, it's right. a it's good mountain. All right, well, are we done? Everyone out there for joining us today. Thank you, Jonathan, for your time, expertise, and your, um, pretty much the enlightenment, actually. Thank you for the spirits um, of these wonderful places and showing us your photography. Um, we'll leave it at that. And yeah. uh, um, right. happy weekend if, 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 if you're so inclined. It's, all, it's only Thursday, but what the hell? It's 2020. <laughs> <laughs> all right, team. Thank you all. Thanks, Ben. Thank Bye. you so much. Feel free to be in touch, okay? Call you. Bye, everyone. All right, I'm out.